Transit Authority Museum. We're in the first car on this side of the platform looking back towards the tunnels which still are connected to the rest of the system. These cars were originally built as open-end elevated cars and used in Manhattan. Much later they were brought uh, to Coney Island shops, closed in, side doors were put onto them, they were uh, electrically operated, and they were used on the 3rd Avenue L in the Bronx <coughs> and the Myrtle Avenue L in Brooklyn because of weight restrictions. Much later, after the Transit Authority realized that they had gotten rid of all the open cars and they wanted something to the museum, they took these down to Coney Island and did a fantastic job of restoring them. You'll see the number 1404 in the car someplace, probably. Okay. Originally, the cars were run in the 1600 series, and they were run as a motor car, a trailer car, and a motor car, three car set. Uh, this is, I might add, the original Brooklyn Rapid Transit coloring on the cars. The salmon roof, uh, what they call the rural red, and the gold lettering. The giveaway on this whole thing is the fact that the letterboard is so narrow. Now, there's a New York City Transit Authority electric uh, steeple cab locomotive. It was built by General Electric. And the locomotive was used predominantly on the South Brooklyn Railroad Company, which was a trolley freight operation run by the transit. It's since been replaced by diesels. and it ran on either trolley pole or third rail. When it was replaced by the diesel engines, they took it down, used it in the subway for, I guess you'd say, permanent way trains down there, and took the trolley poles off it. They were not fitted with uh, multiple unit control, and they had high voltage controllers in the cab. And now, as we stroll down the platform, is one of the Q-type cars. Now, the first cars we looked at were the rebuilt version of this particular car. Uh, the orange and blue color scheme was significant of the 1939 World's Fair and the cars were redone from open cars to closed cars and used out to the World's Fair. Uh, I hope nobody minds me being critical in saying that these cars were painfully slow. Now again, this is the, this is the motorman's cab was in one position and it was moved much uh, uh, back further when the cars were rebuilt. You notice the rattan seating, which was standard on the New York City subway system up until about 1960. Uh, vandalism became very great, and slowly but surely the entire system was converted over to the hard plastic seats that nobody seems to like. I might add that the rattan will just about wear forever. If it's not slashed. Right, right. Now what we're looking at is steeple cab locomotive number six. This, again, was another one of the South Brooklyn locomotives, and when the South Brooklyn dieselized, this was taken down into the subway and used for uh, permanent way trains. This is much heavier than the other locomotive, and it's a Baldwin Westinghouse product. What we're looking at now, 4902, happens to be one of the IRT cars. If you look at between the platform and the side of the car body, you'll notice a difference in width. The IRT was built by August Belmont, the fellow who gave us Belmont Racetrack, and it was built to a narrower loading gauge than the IND BMT cars. This car happens to be one of the trailer cars. Again, being different from IND BMT practice, the car had end vestibules and a center door. Continuing our journey down the platform, we're looking at car number 41, which was a motorized rail carrier. Uh, if you look at the bottom of the cab, you'll see that it is offset. And this was used predominantly to carry rail and ties and things of a bulky nature. The car has uh, four, I think they were 90 horsepower motors. And they were rather selective about who operated them because on a number of, time, a number of times these cars would get caught in third rail gaps. And then you had to go get what was called a bullwhip to get the car off the gap. It's an R12 type car, uh, commonly known as the Stillwell roof. These were built right after World War II, and there were two large batches of these cars built. One were the R10 cars, which were built to the wide loading gauge and used on the IND. These are the narrower version, R12, and were built for the IRT. As you can see, again, we have the space between the platform and the car body. These were just about exclusively used on a flushing line between uh, Times Square and Flushing, Queens. 
I might add too, as long as Richard's got everything running here, that we have a little Australian uh, beggar laying on the car there. And uh, the car is painted in the original interior colors. It's also very clean and has no graffiti. 15 cars now. And this was the next update from the R12. These cars, however, were used just about all over the entire IRT system. Now you'll notice that we have porthole window doors, which was supposed to be somewhat streamlined. And we also went into a red foam rubber seat. Again, we have this little beggar. The last car we're looking at on the platform is an R33. The color scheme is one that was devised in 1963 and used for the New York World's Fair. Again, these cars were used strictly on the flushing line. Now, if Richard will pan around at the cab window over here, you'll see a little W on the side. The W indicates the car is equipped with Westinghouse electrical equipment. And normally on every contract that the Transit Authority got, half the cars were Westinghouse and half the cars were TA, uh, GE. Oh boy, it's a narrator. Now this car, you'll also notice, went into wide European style windows. We also have gone to uh, roof fans on this that are into the ceiling with forced flow through, flow through ventilation. I think you'll notice that the car was built by the St. Louis Car Company. Uh, this is after it became a General Steel cast, a General Steel Industries division. The three major builders of New York City subway cars were the American Car and Foundry Company, Pullman Standard Car Manufacturing, and St. Louis. Although we did end up with one series of Bud cars, which we're going to see shortly. More than one of the IR, uh, BMT R30s, this is with a wide version of the car you were just on. And it was built to replace the BMT standards. The car came through with a very dark uh, Pullman green color scheme. And as we pan back, we're looking at one of the Transit Authority's biggest flops, the R11. There were 10 of these cars built by the Bud Company right after World War II. And these cars had disc brakes and caused no end of trouble. Also, as you see from the cab window, it was a Westinghouse car, and this together with the disc brakes and the various other problems caused for a unique operation. Normally, they would make a train up, and the train would have one of these cars coupled to just about anything else that uh, was compatible to it. Uh, they went to great time and trouble to avoid putting an entire train of these things together. It's also in this car one of the first uses of fluorescent lighting. The crank down upper windows. And at one time, the cars were fitted with signs to tell the passenger exactly where he was. Which was amusing because normally the signs didn't work and you didn't know where the heck you were. Point out the outside door controls on the car. In order to operate the doors on the car, the conductor had to step up onto these two platforms in between the two cars and stick his head out. Underneath here are two levers. The first lever unlocks the doors, the second lever opens the doors. So the conductor would have to be in a position out in between. Now to close the doors, you push this down. All right, the R10s were the last set of cars that uh, had this type of thing before they went to inside door control, much to the conductor's happiness. Now, if Richie will just step back a second, what we're looking at is car number 1575. It's a one of a kind. When they started building the R10 class cars, they wanted a prototype before they did anything to test out riding quality, uh, passenger seating, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because there were a number of changes made. 1575 was built. 1575 is unique in the fact that it has an R10 style car body and low R type running gear and brakes. It is not compatible with any of the. Uh, uh, it, as built, it was not compatible with the R10s. Now it's been changed over so it can be operated uh, a couple of wise with the other cars, the newer cars. Everybody has heard the song Take the A Train, which was made famous by Duke Ellington. These are the cars that opened the A line, which is the west side of Manhattan IND. They're very, very good cars. I've run these cars, I've worked on them. Uh, they're really a pleasure in all ways. 
These cars are only two motors, they're two 140 horsepower motors. It's a very comfortable car. It's a nice riding car. And we see the car in its original condition. There were close to 1,600 of these cars, and they were used on all lines of the IND. Uh, at the end, when they got rid of the BMT steel type cars, I, don't know, I didn't notice any steels in here today. These were used on the BMT Eastern Division. Seven. Number seven is a Westinghouse product, equipped to run on third rail or trolley pole. Number seven is also the locomotive that got me in a lot of trouble many years ago when I came off the Williamsburg Bridge with it. Much too fast. At the time, the locomotive didn't have train stop trips on it, and it was claimed I came off the bridge at 50 mile an hour with it, although I was able to talk my way out of it. It's amusing to point out that the Transit Authority, uh, until the advent of diesel locomotives, did not have a uh, multiple unit on them. And also, if you look down between the cars, it's possible you can see the double, double draw head on it. It has a Westinghouse coupler and a standard MCB coupler on it. So you could couple up to a subway car or a railroad, standard railroad car. It is a big heavy beast. It weighs uh, 51 tons. As I said, the R1 to R9 series had two motors. And what you're seeing on the platform in front of you is one of the motor trucks, both motors being on one end of the car, the other truck being a trailer truck. And I imagine that's probably a Westinghouse 303 motor. They are 140. Uh, horsepower motors, as I said. The cars were only 280 horsepower, and I think the weight horsepower ratio was a little dodgy because they, they really didn't have the get up and go that they should have. What you're looking at now, 2204, I think is one of the greatest subway cars ever built in the United States. The design was uh, first concepted in 1911. The cars were built between uh, 1915 and 1923, there were 900 of these cars built as motor cars and 50 trailer cars. There were several different roof variations of the car, but inside they were all pretty much the same. I'm just getting off a garbage can and I, as I was sitting. And the cars were vastly underpowered, but so darn heavy that they rode like Pullmans. Now, if you walk down to the center of the car, dodge all the poles in here, you'll notice the extreme width of the car. They were very, very comfortable cars, and you can see at the conductor's position a folded down seat. This could be done <coughs> in the rush hours or when the car was not being used as a conductor's operating position. Uh, this is a bad door panel. But the standard door panel would have another recess down in here where your operating key would go in and then you would have an, a second key to be used up here. This would signal the motorman forward, this would signal the motorman to the rear. Now, to open the doors, we would use this to open all the doors on the entire train. And the conductor would stand out in between these doors here, press this button to close everything forward, press this button to close everything rear, and then uh, these would close these two doors. It was really something to see one of these things in a rush hour with uh, a real standing load of passengers on it and having the conductor trying to move back and forth from side to side to operate the doors at various different stations because in the New York City subway system you can have three different stations with the platforms on different sides so the conductor has got to run back and forth <laughs> and get everything going. Now I'm not a great movie star so we'll move on to the next one. The last set that we're seeing in our journey You want to start again? Keep going, all right. What we're looking at now is the last uh, unit in the museum at the present time, and it's 6095. It was a triplex articulated unit. Now, these units were very heavy. Uh, they were fairly powerful, and these were about the first cars on the BMT IND system that had roller bearings on them. And from personal experience, I can tell you a couple times that I almost got myself into trouble by making a brake release on level ground, so I thought, and having the thing roll on me. As we go inside the car, we can see that the seating arrangement is a little bit different. 
and we look back toward the drum connection between the two cars. These cars, uh, a little trick to these things was you held them in series to really get going and then you went over to parallel because they seem to have much greater acceleration in series. You've just looked at the drum connector between the two sections. You might notice the advertising signs within all of these cars. These all are signs that at one time or another have been used in service in the subway system. The bloody shame of the whole thing is when these cars and the uh, R9s and the steels were scrapped, nobody thought about getting the fans. And amusingly enough, these fans are 120 volt fans. They're wired in series. Now going from bottom to top, you'll notice that the car has a Westinghouse H2F control uh, coupler. Underneath the coupler proper, which made up the mechanical and air joints, was a slide box that was operated by a button. This came down and exposed uh, 32 fingers, which made up all your train line circuits for your multiple unit. There was also a multiple unit jumper that went across the cars via door circuits. Up above, you'll see the destination sign and one. Uh, one would have been... What the heck was one? One was uh, Brighton Beach Express. These were normally run in, in three unit sets. The museum is actually set up in an old subway station. This was a stub terminal station, two-track, Court Street in Brooklyn, on Long Island, not to be confused with the one that's over there. And uh, it was formerly a terminal of the HH Brooklyn Local, and this ran between here and East New York. The express trains uh, at Hoyt Skimmerhorn Street, the next station east of here, turned and went to J Street and then subsequently to Manhattan and then up 8th Avenue route of Duke Ellington's A train. The lower level of the station, as you've just seen, is set up with exhibits of heavy equipment, the trucks, the cars themselves. In the mezzanine level of the station are set up exhibits of turnstiles, uh, route maps, and the various little things that go along with making a subway system go. If you look at the side of the board, over there you'll see two green lights. The upper light indicates an eastbound A or CC train. The lower light indicates a westbound A or CC train. And the blue lights over there indicate the track occupancy of this particular station. This is the uh, control board or the model board for this particular interlocking. And just below you, if we will pan down, you'll see the interlocking machine. Now this machine still is alive. It still is used for museum movements in and out of here. 